Welcome. Uh, thank you for coming to this master session, Storytelling that Packs a Punch, Strategies for Success. Uh, welcome also to our virtual participants, and I really appreciate you all being here. I think you'll really enjoy and get a lot out of this session. Before I start, a few details about how this is going to work. First, we'll hear from our team of filmmakers and then from someone who specializes in how to maximize the meaning we can get from data. Then there will be a very brief conversation between the panelists and that before we open it up to all of you for your questions and comments, and I hope you are, uh, will have many questions and comments so we have a great discussion with you as well as from our uh, virtual participants. So very briefly, I'm going to introduce our speakers. I think they'll, they, both, they all will have something to say for themselves. Uh, Kurt Heisler holds a PhD in health services research. He's a senior policy advisor for technology and innovation at the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families. He's also an instructor in pediatrics at the Eastern Virginia Medical School. Kurt's thinking about data and storytelling has been shaped by his experience as an art major, a, uh, a counselor, and a public health practitioner. Kurt has a particular interest in how to use data to help you move from information to insight, also in, in, in configuring data in ways that unlock the stories that it has to tell allowing you to ask your own questions and discover new meanings. Uh, now let me introduce Marjan Safinia. Uh, Marjan's title at her filmmaking company, the Department of Expansion, is Chief of Social Instigation. You'll get a hint about Marge's personality if you go to the Department of Expansion website where she notes, don't waste any time trying to pronounce her funny Iranian name. Her teachers in London used to incorrectly call her Margin, but she prefers Marge, like The Simpsons. Marge is an award-winning filmmaker whose documentaries have played in over 70 international film festivals, including opening the preeminent uh, documentary film, film festival, AFI Docs. Her films have been broadcast in the US, UK, New Zealand, Jamaica, and across the Arab world. Marge's partner in crime is Christina Robbins. She is the head of intellectual gymnastics for the Department of Expansion. Christina is also an award-winning filmmaker. She's a graduate of AFI's directing workshop for women. Her work has appeared on PBS and A&E. Christina, interestingly, has also worked as a management consultant for Fortune 500 companies to shape strategic plans and develop best practices in marketing research. Christina also has performed full-length improvised plays on stages internationally for the past 15 years. So we have high expectations for her today. So welcome, Kurt, Marge, and Christina. Commissioner Lopez, in his opening plenary this morning, said, stories are how we know ourselves and connect with others. I will add to this as a proud undergraduate English major, where we know you get to read a lot of stories, and also a battle-scarred veteran of the 60s, they can also be how we change the world. So, Marge and Christina, let's start with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Hello. Thank you all for coming out to our session today. Um, so how did two filmmakers from Los Angeles end up out here at the 20th annual NCAN presenting on storytelling? And why is this conference called Building Communities, Building Hope? Well, many moons ago, Marge and I were two documentary filmmakers who were very passionate about telling human stories that could shed light on problems and hopefully make the world a better place. And in all of our adventures, meeting amazing people who are working in the trenches every day solving these big problems, we were constantly seeing these amazingly rich, emotional, deeply compelling human stories behind the work that they were doing. But when we actually would reach out and look at the organizations they worked for to see how they were telling their story, this is what we found instead. 40 thousand children die every single day 
from hunger or hunger-related diseases. That's over a million children a month. 15 million children a year. The problem is out of control. So much so that you've probably learned to ignore it. Here are three things I'd like you to know about math. Our mission, to promote creativity, environmental awareness, and community. SWAP is a broad-based group that brings people of diverse backgrounds together to work on issues of common concern. The words in most mission statements can sound vague and easy to gloss over, but the words in our mission statement have all been carefully chosen and are meaningful. So we were very surprised at how often these amazingly worthy causes weren't telling stories and weren't capturing the human heart that was behind their work. Um, and as we got into this field and we started making films, we realized that there were two common misperceptions that led to organizations investing time and money in films that didn't actually produce results. The first misconception is that if we just tell people how bad the problem is, then they'll want to help. And this is the fear and shame approach, and it simply doesn't work. Uh, communications research has clearly shown that if people are going to engage in a cause, they need to hear the messages of hope and they need to be believe in solutions and that solutions are possible. Um, and the other, rather than getting barraged by lots of facts that are designed to basically make us feel guilty and overwhelm us. Um, the other misconception is that we have to explain the internal structure of how we work so that we look like a credible organization to solve this problem. While, of course, you do have to do that. You have to communicate your mission and values and theory of change. That's not where your communication strategy works, and it's not what films are good at. So let's take a moment to talk about what films are good at. And let's talk about the movies. So movies draw the audiences in by telling us a engaging emotional story that has meaning. They make us feel something. They make us question something. They make us see something in a new way. They basically take us on a surprising journey that leaves us someplace very different than where we started. And there's absolutely no reason that in this space, short films can't accomplish those same things. Um, films are, are worth so much more than just you know, something to put on your website or something to put on the conference agenda. This is not just content. They are not information delivery vehicles. And when we think of them that way, we really don't even begin to scratch the surface of what the potential that films have in order to really engage audiences and move the ball forward in a really compelling way for organizations. So, um, it's not just about the story, though. And one of the most important things that Marge and I want to talk about today is that films that produce real impacts don't start with story. They start with strategy. And the question with strategy is always, which story do we have to tell to which audiences to overcome the key obstacles that are getting in the way of our success? So today what we wanted to do is we really want to share with you the strategic storytelling lens that we applied when we started working with the Children's Bureau, and we built the series Building Community Building Hope. Um, and our hope is that your organization, by looking at the example of how we did this, you can think more deeply about the process that you need to go through in order to use authentic, deeply humanistic storytelling in order to really remove the obstacles in your way so that you can engage more people in helping to serve the children and families that are so important to this field. Uh, for us, the work began back in early 2014 when Joan Sharp, who just introduced us, and Melissa Brodowski then of the Children's Bureau contacted us, and they had a simple question. They said, can you help us figure out whether and how film and video might help impact, create real impact on communications and messaging in this field? Um, they told us that there were two main stakeholder groups that they thought would be interested in this work. The first were folks who actually work in the field of child abuse and neglect. Um, and, and those folks can sometimes feel frustrated or fatigued because the work is hard and, you know, um, uh, the pressure is a lot. Um, so they might need a film to re-energize them and uh, help them remember that the work that they're doing is super valuable. And then the second was a stakeholder group of folks who don't work in the field of child abuse and neglect, but have access to children who, who may be part of that population we're trying to reach. So doctors and teachers and childcare workers, etc. The other thing we heard in those initial conversations was something that really kind of piqued our interest. We heard, sometimes it feels like we've been saying the house is on fire for 40 years and nothing is really changing. And this was a theme that kind of kept coming back throughout the, the course of our inquiry. 
uh, of putting the strategy together. And although that's not strictly true, of course, things have changed in the last 40 years, um, we found that the, the fact that it had even come up really interesting. If everybody agreed that something needed to be different, then why wasn't something different? So we put that aside on the interesting things to come back to shelf, uh, and we moved on. We asked those guys to send us a bunch of um, reading, basically, so that we could get up to speed on this field, because it's not a field that we knew anything about. So they sent us a ton of documents, and I have to be completely honest, we were totally dreading reading them, because we thought this is going to be the most depressing and painful reading ever. It's going to be filled with you know, heartbreaking stories of children suffering, and we were sort of really stealing for ourselves for that. Interestingly, when we read it all, we realized there was no emotional stories in any of what we read at all, which we thought was also pretty interesting. Um, and of course, you know, the professional tone of things is different, but still, the, the human face of the story seemed really conspicuously absent for us. Um, we dug in a little more and we realized that historically, when stories had been told, particularly public-facing stories, they were sort of graphic images of bruised and battered kids. And that fell right into that misconception Christina was talking about, which is just, if we just tell people how bad it is, then they'll care. And we know that actually what happens is we just, we become so overwhelmed by kind of um, feeling helpless that we just switch off and disengage. Um, so it was, it was having the opposite effect. Then the good stuff we read, we read that there was all this exciting emerging research happening in your field and the breakthroughs were happening that you know, weren't around 10 years ago. So whether that was neuroscience or the impact of toxic stress on brain architecture or the amazing sort of magical healing powers of safe, stable, nurturing relationships, community programs that were happening that were really sort of innovative. There was all this really great stuff that was happening. But even in the positive stuff, first of all, it was wrapped up in white papers and research documents. And we were thinking, how many people actually read these in the course of their busy days? Um, and then again, completely lacking kind of a human face. So as storytellers, we sort of got through all this and we found ourselves staring into a chasm. On the one side, there was a campaign of fear that was kind of disengaging the, the audiences we wanted to reach. And on the other side, there was this rich repository of hope and optimism, um, but it was locked up in these kind of journals and white papers that were making it inaccessible to the very people who most needed to hear it. So. Uh, we, we scratched our heads and we, we, we dove into our strategy process. And so our strategy process really began with um, interviewing, an extensive amount of interviewing of the best and brightest people in the field. And we asked them the question, what was really working in the field? And where were things getting stuck? What was in the way of achieving success? And the conversations that we had really formed the backbone of our film strategy. So what is a film strategy? Um, we're all familiar with organizational strategies, and again, that's your mission, your uh, values, your theory of change, etc. Um, a film strategy is actually what we use to translate the organizational strategy into the language of film. Now, what we oftentimes find is that when people go out to make a film, one of two things happens. Either they completely forget about all that organizational strategy they have and all their messaging strategy, and they just find a story to tell. On the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, we see people who literally like the last fellow who was telling us that the words in his mission statement were all meaningful, they literally try to just film their mission statement, and there's no story whatsoever. So we engage folks to avoid this problem. We engage folks in this process of translating the organizational strategy into the language of film. And what the film strategy does is it gives direction to your team to say, this is why we're making the film. This is what we hope the film is going to accomplish. This is who we need to reach with this film. And this is what we need them to do to advance our cause. So in this process, we very clearly identify what are the obstacles getting in your way, and who do we need to engage to overcome those obstacles, and what specific messages does that specific audience need to hear in order to change where they are today to where we need them to be. So um, we never, ever start a film without doing a film strategy. Uh, and what we're going to do today is we are going to basically take you through a shortened version of the strategy that we developed for OCAN to develop the series building, community building hope. Um, but we are, for the sake of time, going to simplify this. If you look at your NCAN app, we've put a document on there that is a much more robust strategy worksheet that you can take back to your organization and you can use as a team to sort of figure out how you would translate your organizational uh, mission into film strategy. And by all means, contact us if you have any questions with that. Feel free to share that. And I want to be really clear. We're going to talk about the specific obstacles of what OCAN was trying to achieve with this series. Um, but whatever your obstacles are, whether they be funding or finding new audiences or whatever it might be, this process will work whatever those obstacles are. So today is just very specific to the OCAN objectives. So 
Again, to begin, we um, went out to our list of experts and we asked them, what is getting in the way of achieving your objectives? Where are you stuck? And here is sort of the summarized version of what we heard. So we heard, we all know we need more prevention, but the reality is that resources are still largely targeted towards interventions. Uh, we heard that there are huge strides in dealing with the issue of abuse, but we've got this huge issue of neglect that is less well understood outside of the system. We heard that we are still blaming and shaming parents too much instead of realizing this is a powerful source of solutions for our children. Uh, we heard that although all of this emerging research is making it out into the field, there is still this cloudy disconnect about how to take that research and create programs that have impact. Um, and then finally, we heard that there are so many systems out there with amazing touch points to uh, children and families who could benefit from this amazing emerging research from this field, and yet you're still working in these unconnected silos where there isn't a lot of cross-collaboration to be able to leverage these touch points that they have. <clears throat> Once you have a sense of your obstacles, the next thing is to figure out who is your audience. And you know, the more specific you can get about who is your audience, the easier it is to find them and to reach them with the message. Um, and, and when we say the audience, I think what we were really looking for is who are the most powerful actors in the, in the larger ecosystem that if they were to change the way they do something, the ripple effect of that would be really enormous and have genuine impact. And in this case, it wasn't the general public. And I think it's something worth mentioning uh, in, you know, any of us who work at all in communications, you know, we've all become conditioned to be storytellers and social media mavens. And I think that that's made us believe that this kind of massive public impact is the only metric that counts. So we're sort of desperately like monkeys with peanuts, you know, we're seeking more likes and more clicks and more views. And all those things are great, believe it. We love it when we get a lot of likes and clicks and views too. But if you're trying to make change, the public may not be the primary change-making audience. And in this case, that turned out to be exactly the case. So uh, the main audiences that were identified were primarily, obviously, folks working in the child maltreatment field for whom uh, they knew the research, but perhaps we could create tools to help them communicate some of this to other folks that they needed to engage. Uh, and then a, a network of community leaders and system partners in these sort of siloed um, but crossover sectors who could learn to adopt maybe some of the best new thinking that was coming out of this field and put it into their own practices. Obviously, the funders, everybody's favorite F word, um, uh, who could maybe shift their funding strategies towards prevention and allow folks to work in a new way. And then policymakers and, and lawmakers who could put in place like real legislation to underpin all this, all this new learning. Um, knowing those folks and looking at this list, we sort of took a step back and we thought, wow, if we were successful in actually reaching all of these people, the potential for impact with this kind of work is really significant. So that made us very excited. So now we know who, what our obstacles are, and we have a sense of who the audiences are that we want to attract to be able to overcome these obstacles. And what our next question is, we need to tease apart what's getting in the way of change. We need to understand what is it specifically that those audiences need to see and hear in order to get from where they are today to where we need them to be. And we call this the journey. And the journey is really the beginning of story development and the beginning of understanding about what the content of the film needs to be. Um, and so let's take an example. Am I going to Yes, I am going to take an example. <laughs> Let's take an example from um, our obstacle of silos across sectors uh, coming together to be able to um, help families and children. So where our system partners are today is that really they are suffering from reform fatigue. They are under-resourced, understaffed. They have lots of different mission critical things that they're working on and not enough people to do it in a lot of cases. So when we come to them as the child maltreatment field and say, hey, can you think about adopting some of our practices? is that, you know, they've got their own you know, balls to keep in the air and they might not be as open to considering collaboration with us when we're talking about them helping us solve our problems. Where they need to be is we need to have them in that position that they believe that evidence-based abuse and neglect prevention programs really are the solutions to their problems, that we're demonstrating clearly that when we can use this research for children and families, we can both both fields, both partners can get their needs met. This can be done easily at low cost, and in, at the end of the day, it's in the best interests of children. So now our question is, if that's where we want to take them, what do we need to hear in order to get them from one place to the next? 
So we need to find a story that shows a creative system partnership uh, with the child maltreatment field that really shows someone else solving their own mission critical problems by adopting these practices. We need to show that the populations that that system serves has benefited from the positive supports for children and families. And we need to make sure that we, um, they understand that this is low cost and doable, so it's not another overwhelming thing to take on. And finally, we want to show them that that solution delivers long-term impact for children. So now we know the beats. We have to go hunting for the story that fulfills those beats and brings it to life. And as we worked through each one of our obstacles and audiences, that started to clarify for us more and more what it is we needed to go out and find in terms of story to meet our strategic objectives. Uh, so we went on the hunt for stories of system partners that had successfully worked with uh, the child maltreatment field. And um, we have a new film, actually, that is premiering here at the conference um, about a very unlikely partnership between the Department of Corrections and the Department of Early Learning, and they are here today in the audience, um, and how the two of them work together in an unlikely partnership to serve the best interests of children. So I want to walk you through this. And this is the story that basically checked all of the boxes that we needed for our journey. So one of the things that's so powerful about this story is that you have a massive system like the Department of Corrections with a pretty big mission critical problem, and that is addressing the issue of over-incarceration. Uh, they had a mandate to basically reduce the prison population as well as reduce recidivism so people are not returning to prison if they've come in contact with the system. And they needed to do some fresh thinking about how they were going to meet this mandate. So, at some point they had realized 80% of the offenders in the criminal justice system uh, who have committed nonviolent crimes are parents. And they started to ask themselves, is there something about that parent role that could play a part in this solution? But they're adult corrections experts. Uh, they don't know how incarceration affects children and families. They've never had the mandate to think about children and families. So they reached out to the Department of Early Learning. Um, so when they reached out to the Department of Early Learning, the two worked together to realize that uh, the Department of Corrections already had probation officers who were doing home visits with the offenders who had uh, returned from prison with their children around. And with some training on the part of the Department of Early Learning to provide their expertise and training, these probation officers could be transformed into parent coaches without any risk to public safety. Um, and the beautiful thing about the program was that by reestablishing these nurturing bonds, both the Department of Corrections and the parents um, in this program drastically reduced um, their repeat offenses or recidivism. So recidivism went down significantly because having that nurturing bond with their children really gave them the strength and the support and structure they needed to go on with, um, with the more, uh, making more positive choices in their own life. But at the same time, the Department of Early Learning had eyes on children who had previously been an invisible population. These were children who had suffered trauma but were, might not have come up against any systems yet that identified them. And now they had that opportunity to make sure that these children were getting services. So there you go. They work together. <laughs> they reduce recidivism dr dramatically. And if you see the film, you get to see all the statistics about that. But here you have that incredibly unlikely partnership that came together, and both parties ended up being able to solve some of their mission critical problems. So it was a win win all around. Um, and together, when they built this program, not only did the Department of Corrections drastically reduce their recidivism, but they also did something that was hugely beneficial to the children and families in their state. So by working through this kind of strategic process, this iterative process, you can recognize what the right types of stories are that are going to fulfill that mandate you have, the strategic goals that you have to help an audience get where you need them to go. And this is the way that we worked throughout all of the obstacles um, that we came up with in the film strategy to try and find stories that were going to help us do that. So now we know what our story is and we're ready to pack up our camera and go out and film a story. Not quite yet. Because the one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to make the same mistake and go out and try and film our film strategy. We need to hide the strategy. We like to call it hide the strategy. In uh, compelling storytelling and emotional characters that help us get into this story in a different way. So while we have that strategy as a guiding force, when we tell the story, we need to switch gears and make sure that we can get out and tell real emotional compelling stories that let all these, this information come to life. Um, so, what we want to do now is we want to invite you briefly into our world as filmmakers and storytellers to talk about some of the tricks that we have learned along the way, the tools that we use to make sure that when we go out to tell these stories, we don't film our film strategy, but instead we capture these deeply emotional human stories that help people understand the nature of change and deliver impact on an issue. 
So what's the single greatest tool that we have in our toolkit? For our money, it's authenticity. We believe that we live in a time when all of us are sort of craving truth. There's not enough of it around. And, um, and authenticity has this sort of magical power of piercing through a feeling of being sold something, which we all constantly feel all day long. Um, and it speaks to the, the deeply human piece of all of us that connects us all. Um, so it's a tremendously powerful tool for engaging audiences who may otherwise be disengaged. Um, uh, the problem is that words like authenticity and credibility have been thrown around for a long time, uh, in, especially in the cause communication sector. And uh, the, the issue with it is that creating authenticity is a bit of a conundrum, right? You can't sort of try to be authentic. That doesn't work. You either are authentic or you aren't. So what are some of the tips and tricks that we use to create an environment where authenticity and truth come, come through? Well, we often think of this metaphor of farmers versus hunters. So when you think about farmers, this is a very nice uh, pre-thought through plan and the job at hand is just to execute against the plan. And when you think about that in terms of video, that's the kind of scenario where maybe there's a script, maybe there's a storyboard, there's usually a teleprompter, there's one team who like works on the talking points and shapes them all and then there's someone else who's has to stand in front of the camera and deliver the talking points that these people did. And, you know, it, it does, it's a particular kind of film, it works very well in some circumstances, but it does feel quite sort of rigid and inauthentic. Um, and for our money, we've always been much more partial to hunting. Because we, frankly, really enjoy the process of hunting, but more importantly, we enjoy the spoils of the hunt, the most important of which is definitely authenticity. Um, in a farming approach, we're not, I mean, in a hunting approach, we're not going out and just shooting from the hip and, and you know, picking up the camera and going for anything that sounds interesting. All this strategy and thought work is underpinning us, but when we get out there, we have to change our behavior and tread lightly so that we don't end up creating something that feels contrived and over-controlled and inauthentic. So, uh, what are some of the, the, the rules of the hunt that we have created for our hunting adventure? <laughs> Rule number one, cast your story wisely. Um, in documentary, we often think about documentary as the pursuit of the truth from a specific per person's point of view. And um, there's a great researcher, empathy researcher, Paul Slovich, and his research has shown clearly that we are much more uh, apt to engage in an issue when that issue has been framed around a single person's story rather than when it's been framed around facts meant to convey the scale of a problem. So even though it's not something you would typically think of in documentary, it is incredibly important that we cast our characters wisely. And what that means is we're going out to look for folks who are very comfortable and confident in telling their story, uh, folks who have personalities that will resonate across the screen, and people whose own experience of the truth matches with the strategy that we're working on. So once we have that and we're talking to people, we, we have a few other things, like we, we have to really engage our intuition as we're like milling through this process and just get really human when we're talking to people and ask ourselves, um, is this person feel authentic when they share their story? Are they comfortable in their own skin? Do they speak in everyday language? And this is particularly important for experts because when you speak in lingo, you really alienate your audience. Can people explain deep, complex ideas in ways that are really accessible to folks? Um, and are they connecting with us as filmmakers? And if not, what can we do to make them more comfortable? Because really, at the end of the day, um, what it's, this is all about is making sure that people can be their authentic selves in front of the camera. And Marge and I invest a lot of time and energy in building relationships with people long before we put them in front of the camera so that we can really guarantee that sort of the warmth and comfort they have with us translates through the screen to our audience. And that makes this all feel a lot more authentic and real to our audiences. Um, and as the filmmaker Werner Herzog often says, there are no stars in my documentary, but everyone in front of my camera is treated like royalty. So it's incredibly important to think about how we cast and how we treat the folks that we are engaging in and telling the stories of. Rule number two, the big wigs aren't always the best, and so it appears. Um, okay, so this one is tricky. Sometimes it's a bit politically tricky. Um, but let me tell you a story that will maybe shed some light on it. When we first started working in this field, we uh, we're working with an organization up in the Bay Area. They are um, experts in juvenile justice, and we were making a film for them. 
Um, they organized for us to meet the chief of probation of Santa Clara County, the former chief, I should say. And we got to sit down with her in person to check out if we thought she'd be great in the film. Now, this woman was um, a legend. She, her resume was extraordinary. She'd come to the department when it had really bad press, and she'd completely turned the reputation of the department around in like four or five years. So she was really quite a prolific woman. Um, but when we sat down with her, we realized she was a very quiet lady, and she spoke like this a lot. And she was also very kind of attached to this language that really felt like talking points that her team had put her on a tight leash and said, don't veer off this. Maybe she'd had a bad experience with the media in the past. Anyway, as we were talking to her, it just sort of felt really, really clear to us that this woman wasn't going to work well on camera. And of course, when you sit someone down under the lights, that just becomes worse and worse and worse. So we left the meeting and we sort of felt a little weird about it. Um, but we knew in our guts that wasn't going to work for us. As it happened, that day they had also assigned us a, a probation officer to show us around the facility. And this dude was straight out of central casting. He was a total, like, tough nut cop, but he was funny and he was warm and he was just 100% real. And as we spent the day with Sean walking around, we realized that he was the one who was speaking really authentically about the experience for youth in the system. And he wasn't sugarcoating and he wasn't treading on eggshells and he was just being 100% real in how he talked. And we just, for us, it was clear as day. This was the guy that we needed to use uh, from the system side in the film. So we had to call our clients and we're like, so <laughs> we don't think we should use the chief. We think we should use this guy, Sean. And they were like, Sean, but like he's so tough when he talks about these kids. And we said, exactly. That's exactly why we want to use him because you believe the guy, right? He's not a BSer. And so when he says it, when he says, you guys know what you're doing as a program, we believe him. And he's a boots on the ground guy. So it just, you know, it feels real. Luckily for us, we have good clients. We pick our clients well, and we were able to use Sean in the film. And ever since then, Sean has become a shorthand, which Christina and I use in meetings sometimes when we know that we have to make a different casting decision. Um, whenever we're casting, let's say we think we're going to use three people in a film, we talk to at least 10 because having that latitude allows us to hunt for exactly the right person. And as Sean showed us, it's not always the sort of hero character who might start at the top of the list. Rule number three, drop the talking points and relax. So now we've cast our characters. We know who we're going to be using and the experiences the, uh, that we're going to be portraying on camera. It's time to put them in front of the camera. And um, the reality is that uh, no matter who you are, when you pull those lights out and you get that camera set up and you sit somebody down, it's daunting. And it doesn't matter whether, there's a daunting picture. It doesn't matter whether you are a mom on assistance or you are the expert who knows everything there is to know about your subject matter. This can be really, um, you know, this can set people off in, into the wrong direction with nerves. But here's the thing. We chose the people that we're putting in front of the camera because we know, they know everything there is to know about their authentic truth. And our only job is to tease that out and make them comfortable to deliver that. And what gets in the way of that is when they think they have to perform to some expectation we have uh, of messaging. If we you know, are trying to get them to use specific language or, or incorporate talking points, as soon as we do that, that's a farming plan. And as soon as we move towards that farming plan, then people feel nervous to perform. And we need to do exactly the opposite. So we never send questions ahead of time. We don't want people to prepare their answers. We trust that when we ask them a question and they just share the truth with us, that that authentic sharing for the first time is going to be more real. Um, and we are holding the strategy in our heads the whole time that we're talking. So we can encourage them to let go of those talking points and scripts because we're keeping track of what we need. We have to make sure that they don't feel that, but we are tracking and making sure that we're getting what we need. And we always make sure that people talk to us. We always say, you know, talk to us like we're at a dinner party together. Keep this conversational and keep this light because that authenticity really reads um, across the camera. And even if a talking point does come out, we always try to find a way to keep the conversation and shift it so we can make those talking points points more human. Um, so you chose this person because you know that if they just come and deliver their authentic truth, it's going to work. And the only thing you need to do is to get out of their way and let them do that. So if we relax, we allow them to relax. And then we've invited them to be their authentic selves in front of the camera. And this, this interview style does take more time, but the investment of time that you put into it pays remarkable dividends because you have authentic stories coming across the screen. Rule number four, show, don't tell. Um, so 
now we have our characters. We've got interviews. We've got that backbone of the story. Now we need to really search for things that are happening in the real lives of our characters that demonstrate uh, the work that we're trying to explain and what is happening in their lives that's real. And one of the classic sins that we talk about with Show, Don't Tell is something we call the black box. And what this is is that organizations, a lot of times when they make films, the first thing they'll do is they'll set up and explain the problem, and then they'll uh, invite in participants uh, to share their story and, and talk about you know, participating in the program, and then the participants will tell you that the program really turned their lives around. How that transformation happened, what the struggles were along the way, what the obstacles were that they faced, all of those things that we as humans really would help us to engage in their story, all of that is obscured in the black box. We're just told that it works. So, um, and a lot of times, unfortunately, the, the lingo we hear a lot of times repeated over and over, and I apologize if this is in your current videos, uh, but people will say that our programs uh, bring hope and we change lives. And, the fact is, that doesn't give the audience any kind of real emotional hook to grab into your story and feel that, and it makes you sound like every other nonprofit out there because everybody communicates that their programs bring hope and change lives. So we need to see it. Beware of the black box. And the unique way in which you work with people, that is at the heart of your story. So show the transformation. Let us as an audience witness that and go along on that journey with you. And don't just tell us to take your word for it, because that's pretty hard to do. Um, so similarly, when we're telling these stories of real people, we need to find these real things that uh, relate to the storytelling that we're doing. And instead of being, bringing people to um, some artificially set up situation or into your conference room to, to be interviewed, go to them, okay? Humans in their own habitat act naturally. When we put people in situations that are contrived, they feel uncomfortable, and that translates to our audience as fake and forced. So it's very important that we try to go out to them. And there is a, a lot of times when we think about this show, don't tell model, we kind of use this um, concept from the author Henry James called the theory of illumination. And what that means is um, in, in narrative, every time you write a scene, you see your character interacting with other people or with the world. And each of those interactions sheds light on who that character is. It's like turning on the lights of a room one at a time until you see that room is fully illuminated. And in our documentary work, this idea of shooting humans in their own habitat is the same concept of making sure that we are providing opportunities to see people as they really are. So, we always push to be allowed to film in people's homes, to go into the schools, to uh, see um, uh, home visits in, at, in, in progress, wherever we can go that actually shows the work that you do on the ground so that we can be part of and bring the audience along in that process of transformation because that's where real life happens. When we were making the film uh, about uh, the PUSH program in Iowa that's part of the series, we met Belinda. Belinda was a mom, is a mom, who uh, was in the process of trying to get her custody of her children back from CPS. She'd been in an abusive relationship and she hadn't been able to keep her kids safe. And when she left uh, the guy, she'd become homeless. Um, thanks to PUSH, she was now in this sort of innovative housing first program and things were really starting to turn around for her. And by all accounts, Belinda was a success story. Now, we'd met Belinda with her kids, and she was an amazing mom. You could just see that she was a really amazing mom. But when we showed up at her house the first time to film, I have to say we were a little bit taken aback. Uh, we walked in, and there was literally laundry on every imaginable surface that you could think of in her, in her living room. And there was one small rug in the middle of the room, and there were these giant kind of spaghetti stains. And she kind of looked down at them and said, oh, we've just only just got a table and chairs for the first time so that you know, we don't have to eat on the floor. Um, and you know, it, it's not the kind of image that someone who was a farming kind of person who was going to set out to showcase a success story would have chosen this environment in which to film. But for us, it was perfect, because the chaos that we found in her life was this inherent marker of the, uh, of, of what she was struggling, how, and what, how, what a struggle it was for this woman to hold all the pieces of her life together. It was the real work she was doing, and that's what made it so authentic. She didn't seem bugged by it, so we decided not to be at all bothered by it, and we didn't make any effort to kind of sanitize it or clean it up um, in any kind of way. In fact, we said to Belinda, hey, do you want to take some time to fold some of your laundry while we're here? That's fine by us. And uh, she did, and we filmed it, and it ended up being this really beautiful kind of lyrical, um, self-reflective, B-roll sequence that we were able to use in the film. So, you know, people don't feel judged if you're not judging them. And well, we always try to sort of see through the clutter of people's life to the human being inside them, as do many of you who work in this field. 
And you know, when you speak to the human being inside anyone, they reveal it for you. So in those kind of pressure situations where you're with cameras and you have a deadline, the trick is to go with the flow and adapt. Because if you don't scare them with the weight of your expectations, then you get the real person coming out. And rule number six, we don't need another hero. Um, we were very lucky to be at a talk a couple of years ago by the journalist David Bornstein of the New York Times, and he was talking about solutions journalism. And he said something that really resonated with us in terms of the way we work. Um, he said that portraying heroes who only experience success can be counterproductive when you're trying to encourage people to make change. It's in seeing the struggle to, over, to do something, obstacles and all, that we, the audience, find a desire to engage and, Im more importantly, make change happen. Um, so for us, stories are the most resonant when we can include the highs and lows of what it took to make change. And while there are absolutely amazing hero aspects to the work that all of you are doing in this great field of prevention, to just tell your story in a purely heroic way belies the truth of the struggle and the difficulties that are at play in making change happen. And rather than encouraging our audience, a hero story tends to alienate our audience because they look at that story and they look at those folks and they say, oh, well, they're just uniquely talented and they know how to do it. Rather than looking at everyday people who just decided to dig in, do their best to try and solve a problem, faced obstacles and overcame them. And when they see that instead, they see the room for they themselves to try and engage these solutions and make change happen as well. So all of the stories that are in this series are definitely about programs that work. I mean, we're profiling things that are having an impact and, and delivering results. But it's not just that we show that programs work. What we're trying to show is that there was a process at play that, and a learning that happened over time that these programs went through to get to the point that they were able to have the impact that they have. Um, and so what our hope in making these films is that we are contributing to a learning community for um, the child maltreatment field where there's open sharing and transparency of the lessons learned and the things that people are going through, uh, and that everyone is invited in by these stories to find their own way to engaging solutions that are going to make a difference for the children and the families that you serve. So the core principles of everything we've talked about and shared with you today really are all of the sort of uh, storytelling tools that we use to try and make stories that don't just uh, look great or entertain, but, but that actually create results for you and create real change. Um, and in the document on the NCAN app, again, there'll be lots more pro tips on there um, and a much more robust strategy document that you can work through. But before we wrap up, we wanted to share with you the opening and the closing of our Department of Corrections film. Uh, we don't have time to show the whole film here, but um, it will be available. Marge will tell you more about that. Um, but we wanted to just show you the opening and the closing so that you could see some of the things that we're talking about in action. So here we go. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> So you guys are reading 20 minutes? Yeah. 20 minutes a day? Yeah, at least. Jackson, what's your favorite book? Yeah. Is this a frog? Yeah. Oh. Department of Corrections, Amanda speaking. I kind of see my role in this program as kind of a half law enforcement, half social worker. As a traditional community corrections officer, my interactions with families would be limited. You're not there to build the support with the family first. You're there to work with the offender first. And this program, we reverse that and we work within the family and in their house first because if that's not going well, they're not going to succeed when they get out. Good, how are y'all? Good, thank you. Hi, Jackson. Mix it. Now yeah, you want to touch it? We watch our children's faces a lot to see you know, if this is okay or not. <laughs> our relationship with the Department of Early Learning, honestly, it was like peanut butter and jelly. I mean, it just really fit. We all had a similar impassioned idea around, wow, you guys have all these great skills and all these great opportunities to engage kids. Oh, more, and we have this population where we know that there's difficulty in engaging with kids for our parents. So how can we come together and start working together? The parenting sentencing alternative law was born out of a prison reduction idea. If we could transfer low risk or nonviolent offenders out of prison using electronic monitoring in order to be home with their kids, then we could save state dollars by reducing the inmate population and holding only those that we really need to be holding in prison. Spray tan if that's awesome. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So yesterday I got my bracelet cut off, which means that it is the end of my sentence. I am done with my time. Best cake ever. So there's been 301 participants who have completed the community parenting alternative. Our rate of success in terms of a return to prison rate, only 8% of the people who've participated and successfully completed our program have gone back to prison in five years. The state average is 30% in the three year period. We're saving money phenomenally around social costs, foster care costs, incarceration costs. But honestly, I think the bigger benefit is the maintaining of that parental bond. I think when offenders are successful parents, they stay out of prison. They stay engaged with their kids. When parents are engaged with their kids, we see healthy young adults. We saw in bringing our two systems together, the expertise and wisdom and passion around success coming from both places and wove that in a different way. My hope for others in this great field of prevention is that you can look for those unlikely partners. I'm excited to think that we get to provide an opportunity for others to say, hey, it can be done and it can be done successfully and safely. Um, and for the benefit of kids, because really what this is all about is the best interest of children. I love you. I'll see you in the morning. Okay, so just before we wrap up and hand off to Kurt, uh, I just want to talk a minute about this series of films and how you can use them. Um, so when we uh, were commissioned to make these, it was very clear from the beginning the Children's Bureau wanted to provide these tools for you, the field, to use freely. So we want you to use them as if they were your own, meaning you can put them on your website, you can put them on your social media, you can send them out in your email blasts, you can uh, download them and use them in your team meetings to talk with your staff about a different way to do things. You can. Uh, send them to partners who you want to have a meeting with about collaborating in some new way and have them watch it. Really, we want you to embrace these and use them as your own. You can find them all at cantasd.org, uh, which will be up on the slide when Christina picks it. And, um, and there's a DVD, which I was supposed to wave around for you, but I left it in my purse, uh, that you can get at the Cantasd booth here at the conference. Um, but selfishly, uh, there's one more piece we'd like to ask of you. We want to understand from those of you who have tried to use the films or would like to try to use the films but are having some kind of an obstacle, we'd like you to come and tell us how we could help make these films more useful for you. Um, whether that be that you are, it would be helpful if you had a discussion guide or if you had access to sort of research that backs up some of the stuff that we see in the films or contact information for who you can learn more detailed information about. Whatever those tools are that you think would make this something that you could actually build into your, your arsenal of tools, we'd love to hear about it. We're going to be here for the next couple of days. You can reach us through cantasdia.org or through, through OCAN or, you know, I'm sure it's not hard to find us. You can just Google Department of Expansion and find us. Um, but really, we won't feel like we've done a good job until the tools that we've made are being actively used by all of you. So we also uh, want to be part of this learning community and we really encourage you to, to reach out and tell us. And we're thick skinned. If you think that something's totally not working, please tell us because that's exactly our opportunity to learn and do better. So with all of that said, we're going to hand off to Kurt Heisler. I'm sorry if we ate into your time. No? Good. Uh, and then we'll be back at the end to take some questions. Thank you all for coming and thank you for your time. There's a phone up here if anyone wants it. <laughs> this is Ben, my seven-year-old boy. He's adorable, isn't he? This is actually my only slide, so I hope that's OK. No, I'm just kidding. Ben is, is great at many things. He's good at freaking out whenever he finds a new Skylander in the store. He's good at modeling like a Calvin Klein model for a photo shoot. He's good at laughing hysterically every time he farts, because there's nothing more hilarious to a seven-year-old boy than a well-timed fart. It's the first time that was live streamed at these conference, I'm sure. He's great at recreating scenes from classic movies, like Jacob's Ladder when Tim Robbins is in the bathtub realizing he's gone insane. 
This is a project we're working on together, so there'll be many more. But there's one thing he's not good at, according to Fairfax County Public Schools. He's not good at telling a story. So apparently this is something that they test our kids now, is how well they can tell and then retell a story. I didn't know this. And so he's not good at this because let's look at this story together. There's a cat named Bob. Bob liked fish. To catch fish, Bob went to the lake, brought a fish home. Bob ate the fish. The fish was good. So they give a story like this to your child, and then they say, retell it. What's the main theme? So this is what Ben does. There was a cat. Not exactly the depth of retelling <laughs> they were looking for. And so when they sat down and shared this with me and said, you know, he may have some trouble, we may need to do some intervention, I said, you know, actually, I think I know what the problem is. And they said, really, what's that? And I said, I think your story sucks. <laughs> I mean, there's no character depth to Bob. We, we don't know Bob's hopes and ambitions and his trials and traumas. At no point does it even say Bob was hungry, which could have led to some tension and some buildup, and then he catches, it just he gets a fish and he goes home. They didn't really care for my reasoning, but I'm so glad Ben didn't try to retell the story, because the story is really bad. A good story starts off funny. A good story is cute. A good story has an arc, a dramatic arc, where there's some build-up. We learned about Ben and his funniness and his goofiness, and then there's some tension. And then there's some resolution to that arc. And it induces empathy. I shared funny pictures of Ben, goofy pictures of Ben, so you could sense who he was as a boy, as opposed to just quickly telling you the last part of that story, which was really the core of that story, but it would have been ineffective had I not prefaced it with, let me tell you about Ben. Let's change the mood here a little bit. This is the hospital. I knew this would be hard. This was the hospital that my dad spent the last two weeks of his life in. It's the hospital I spent the last two weeks of his life in. This is his room in the ICU. You see, he got sick on a Sunday evening in April in 2011, five years ago. Very sick. He went upstairs and went to sleep. He had been sick before, deeply sick. When he was 30, he was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer. And the doctor said, you have a few, maybe months to live. We don't even recommend treatment. But he wasn't ready to give up. His wife, my mom, pregnant with my older brother at the time. And he said, give me everything you've got. And he won. He had that little baby, Billy, my very annoying brother. Then they had a dog. Then they had another brother, Carl, also annoying. Then they had me. There's me on the left, obviously the coolest and the cutest of the three. Thank you. But as things would have it, uh, that cancer that he thought he beat had found him again. 43 years later, where the scar tissue from the surgery he had in 1970 caused a blockage that Sunday night, which led him to fail fast and led all of us to hear. As an art major in college, 
who loved photography, I was used to documenting everything, usually my friends. But documenting, documenting, documenting the death of a loved one isn't exactly what my family had in mind. It can be done gracefully, and it has been done gracefully, but this was not the time for it. So I have two memories with my dad in this bed that I'd, I'd like to share, but I don't have any pictures for it. So I'd like you to create a picture for yourself that makes sense to you. This is a picture of my dad unbuttoning his jacket because the room was so hot. But he didn't have a jacket on. And the room wasn't very hot. The nurses told us this is ICU psychosis. Something that happens to our brain, a form of delirium, a brain's way of dealing with the dysfunction, not knowing what is day and what is night, the overstimulation of beeping machines, the understimulation of being in the same room looking at the same place with no windows. It is our brain's way of creating its own stories to fill the space. This is a picture of my dad looking up at the ceiling, smiling, watching a sailboat cut through the water. He loved sailing. This was not a memory and a moment I wanted to take away from him with medicine or correction. I let him have that moment. It was a story that his brain and him needed at that moment. He loved sailing. After my dad passed away, my three brother, me and my three, two brothers drove to Maine and found the sailboat, the Angelique, that my dad sailed in for 20 years. We found the captain, Captain Jim Sharp, which is a great name for a sailboat captain. And we shared stories of my dad with him, and he shared stories of our dad of my, with us that we'd never heard before. We got on a dinghy, small boat that sits on a bigger boat, with Captain Jim Sharp, and head, head, headed out to the water, and again, telling more stories along the way, amazing stories, things we'd never known about my dad. And we rested his ashes in the water here, outside a lighthouse that my dad sailed through every year when he would go to Maine on that Angelique. This is Curtis Island, Camden Harbor. This Friday is my dad's birthday. So at happy hour or at the airport terminal, pour one for him. A good story is serious. A good story is not cute. A good story has an arc. And a good story induces empathy. I share both of these stories point out that there is no perfect formula for a good story. Two very different experiences, one funny, one sad. Both good stories, I hope. They do have two things in common, though. An arc, an empathy. For the arc, narratologists, Yes, there is a group called narratologists, and they study narratives. They call this the dramatic art. It starts with something new and surprising. I gave you some funny pictures of Ben, the story of 
Bob the cat, the surprising thing is how he interpreted that. And then there's some tension, me and the teacher going at odds about why he did it that way. And then there's some resolution. Ben's better than you are, teacher. The story of my dad had an arc as well. Builds up with his sickness, the surprise, the surgery from 1970. The tension and the experiences of living in that ICU, with, ICU room with him. And then the resolution of my brothers going to Maine to let him go. For the empathy piece, if I told these stories well, you had a sense of who these people were, the experiences they had, and maybe you were able to feel that you were there. Narratologists call that transportation. The ability of a story to transport you into a character's life or the experience that they're living. We feel transportation and a sense of wonderment when we see E.T. and Elliot being chased by government agents and lift off into the sky. Transportation happens when we feel that sense of fear as Jaws approaches his first unsuspecting victim in the movie. This is transportation because the way the storyteller has created the narrative has helped, you put, has helped put you there. I say this all in an effort for you to think about your own stories that you are trying to tell, to convince people to fund your programs or do whatever. How can you help put them there? How well do we tell our own stories? I often wonder how well our government reports induce, induce empathy. I know you don't really think about government re reports and empathy in the same sentence. But that's only because of the limits of past imaginations, our own imaginations, and the bureaucracies and confines of the space we work in. But as much as Congress tells us what stories or reports to submit, as much as your supervisors tell you, I doubt any of them say, make it as least interesting as possible. <laughs> so why don't we make them interesting? So let's look at the child maltreatment report. I'm the federal project officer for NCAN, so I am responsible for the content of this report. And I have a lot of problems with it. It's 238 pages long, 23 exhibits, 42 tables, lots and lots of words, no stories. But this is about children who've been abused and neglected. And every one of them has a story to tell. Why can't we find even just one story to put in this book? What stops us from doing that? What stops me as somebody who can actually change this from finding a survivor and saying, can you at least write a letter on the front page of this to give us your story? Would be cheap, wouldn't cost money, I wouldn't have to get too much approval. What stops me from changing this to add something more useful and more effective? Why don't I change the cover to this? the number of children that died that year. If I want somebody to pick up this report, they're going to be curious, and they're going to remember that number. But instead, it's buried in chapter 4. Why don't we do this? And why don't you do this if you're in that position? What stops us from innovating and thinking differently and more creatively about changing sort of these bureaucracies we work in and these patterns and these histories that have been given to us, what stops us from changing them and doing them differently? Risk. Maybe the press release people wouldn't like this. They'll say it's a bit of a downer. And I say it's a report about child abuse. It's supposed to be a bit of a downer. Maybe somebody won't like it. 
eh, I did something wrong. At a certain point, you have to stop living in that fear and just do it and try it and see what happens. So let's talk about data and the medium. So we know from science that stories that are personally and emotionally compelling engage our brain more. That's why we remember them more. It's because something different is happening in our brain. And the form in which the narrative is told also seems to matter. There's a book from the 60s, Marshall McLuhan, The Medium is the Message. And it's the form that Christina and Marge talked about, and it's the form I'm going to be talking about now. And the form is not a PDF government report. <laughs> the form explains why we cry at movies, but are less likely to cry when reading a book. The movie is engaging more parts of our brain. Christina and Marge use film to tell their stories, and the last film I made was in high school with my friends. It involved an, uh, an elf named Camelkey, a magic fig, and a talking bottle of ketchup. <laughs> That's right. It's, the point is, film is not my area of expertise. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave that to them, but art is. I was an art major in college, hated math, I failed all math courses. I became a counselor and I worked in residential treatment, doing individual and family therapy with kids there and their families, art therapy. I got frustrated about the system having failed these kids so many times, and so that led me to public health to help me understand what's happening at a population level. I got frustrated with that because there wasn't con a connection to policy. So I got into health services research, and that led me to DC, where I thought I could make a difference in the policy space. And then this cool thing arrived on the horizon called data visualization. I was like, cool, I can now do my art stuff again. Data visualization is a perfect blend of art and data science, of math and art. And I'm going to show you some examples of this, because I think this is where we can start to tell stories better through data visualization. But let's revisit what's happening in our brain. When we're listening to a PowerPoint presentation with bullet points and bullet points, there's only two parts of our brain that are really engaged. Comprehension and language processing. Our brain is simply decoding words, and that is it. When we add a story, or music, or a film, or data visualization, our brain is engaged in many more spaces. Our amygdala is engaged, that's where our emotional center is. Our hippocampus is engaged, that's where we have memories and experiences. Our motor cortex is engaged if there's music, because that's what makes us dance. And I think about that often when I'm trying to tell a story, is I don't say, what do I need to add to this story? I tell myself, how can I engage more of their brain? That's the heuristic I use to help me figure out how to present something. How can I engage more parts of their brain? Go a quick history of data visualization in the Children's Bureau. This is the early 20s. Map at the top shows the percentage of children working in agricultural areas. The map at the bottom, the percent of kids with illiteracy, finding a connection between the rural states for both illiteracy and child problems with uh, no child labor laws, because the kids were on the farm instead of being in school. And they drew this map. Can you imagine now your boss says, you know, could you add a different thing or shade this in? You would have to redraw this. So they did this in the 20s without any software, which means there's no excuse we can't, at a minimum, be doing some of this with our data. They used this to actually make a case to 
create the first child labor law ever in the US, which CB Children's Bureau started to handle. And they used data visual, visualization to help tell that story. Another one, the famous baby thermometer. I'm not sure who it was famous to, but it was famous, showing the relationship between a father's income and infant mortality, one of the first areas of research that started to make a connection between poverty and adverse outcomes. Another example of a data visualization they used to make changes, and Congress, because of this, passed the nation's first social welfare measure that provided federal funding to health care programs for mothers and children. Anyone know who this guy is? If you were part of the court improvement program talk, you're not allowed to answer. William Playfair. That's what I thought. Nobody cares about that either. This guy is a big deal. He invented the bar chart. Yes. Now he's awesome. He also invented the line graph. The area chart, and because he wasn't done with that, he invented the pie chart. <laughs> this guy is awesome. What I find amazing about that is that we assume that all the visuals, tools we have in front of us have been done, and they haven't. It took a person thinking about how to show something differently to come up with these. And we have thousands of more visual tools in front of us that we cannot envision now, but as technology expands and as our experiences expand, we will be developing more and more ways to tell stories and share data. Because some of them haven't been invented yet. First, one of the first bar charts to appear on the, uh, in the landscape in 1786, commercial and political atlas showing the import and exports of Scotland to and from 17 countries. Again, he hand drew this. So if he made a mistake, he had to redraw it. This pie chart, first pie chart we think we've ever seen in the literature, showing the proportions of the Turkish Empire located in Asia, Europe, and Africa. I mean, it's amazing we take this for granted, but at this point, it had never been done before. Any uh, epidemiologists in the audience, public health people? You might recognize this map. It describes an area in London, Soho, London, in 1854 that, where there was a cholera outbreak. It was created by the father of modern epidemiology, John Snow. I know what you're thinking of. <laughs> All right, not the John Snow from Game of Thrones. A far less sexy version of John Snow, this guy. He was pulled in because people were dying in Soho. And so he went around and he interviewed people living in that area and said, what are you eating? What are you drinking? What are you doing? And he did that around the block. And he brought a minister with him because at that time people didn't trust a public health person. Many communities still don't. And he collected data and stories from all these people. And he started to sort of see a pattern. And you see these little black bar graphs. Let's zoom in here. Those are where people died. And so he started to see where a lot of people were dying. And he figured out a lot of them were dying around this water pump at the corner of Broad Street and Cambridge Street. And he said, there's something wrong with this water pump. And he convinced, he used this map to convince the local authorities to take off the damn handle so people would stop drinking it and dying. He also used this map and this research to convince them that cholera is not, you don't get cholera by inhaling infected air, which was the common belief at that time. You get it by drinking contaminated water. Turns out that pump was built three feet away from a cesspit that leaked. Uh, that pump is still there, so if you're ever going through Soho and you're thirsty, <laughs> it's on you. His work changed a lot about public health and led to a lot of new policies, not just in London, but across the world, uh, to prevent these kind of outbreaks from happening. This is a cool data visualization. Any guesses what it might be? Friday night in New York, Domino's pizza delivery person. 
following everywhere he went. I think it's fun, it's silly, but we could do this with our own data. We could do this with how long it takes certain kids in a state or community to drive to their therapy appointment because some reason the judge of the court decided it'd be a good idea to send him to therapy three hours away from his home or put him in a foster home four hours away from his biological family that he hopes to reunite with. If we visualize that data, we could tell a story and say, we are sending these, two, these kids too far away. I use silly examples like this to help inspire my own thinking about how I can apply that to our own data. And to me, that is one that stood out. Measles. On the left, every square describes thousands of cases of measles. The blues are very few. The yellows and oranges are getting bad. Lots and lots of cases. And then there's a line in the middle when vaccines are introduced. I have already told the story. It has told the story. I don't need to explain exactly how compelling and convincing this is that maybe vaccines had something to do with that. Really amazing visualization. Dashboards, we're hearing a lot about dashboards. Um, many good ones, many bad ones are out there, but it is an effort to pull in charts and data from different pieces into one view so you can see things in context as opposed to one chart at a time. So these are becoming very popular. They're good tools to use. As an art major, I can't not share some art. art this artist, Patrick Smith, a freelance digital designer interested in conveying the experience of living with a mental illness. This is anorexia. Agoraphobia, fear of open spaces. OCD, the lights might not be clear, but there's one of those that's just a little off. Usually all the OCD people in the audience are like, oh God, change it, <laughs> I need it fixed. Narcolepsy. I wanna show you a visualization I did. Uh, this is a map of the US and the lights aren't great in here, but there's orange dots, and every orange dot represents one or more cases of maltreatment that happened at the start of the fiscal year. And so as the dots, as when we hit play on this, um, as the dots sort of get bright, some get dim, and the dim ones are ones from the day before, and the new bright ones are the new ones. So let's hit play on this, and we're gonna walk through the whole fiscal year Are we able to turn down the lights for this? This is the holidays, Christmas in the US. We start to see strong pockets in Los Angeles, California, the Bronx, New York, Cook County, Illinois. We're high density populations. It makes sense that we'd have more abuse there. It's June now. This is summertime for the kids. This is what our country looks like. And this is at the end of the fiscal year. This is fiscal year th uh, 13 data. So I wanna do something Different now, it's the last thing I'll talk about. I wanna show you the same visualization, but I'm gonna add something to it because what we just experienced went through our visual cortex. We see light when we see something, an art or a person, it's just light that hits our retina. And then it travels past our retina into the back of our brain. And that's where our visual cortex is. It's this thin sliver of tissue about the size of a silver dollar and when the light hits that, at this point, our brain is simply saying, what color is it? Is it bright? Is it dim? What's it look like? It's not making any sense. It's not adding meaning. It's only when it leaves and goes to other parts of your brain that it starts to make some meaning. But if we add music to this, then we have it coming in this way and goes into our auditory cortex. And that's where some amazing things happen. After our brain interprets the basics, the rhythm, the tempo, how loud it is, how soft it is, Especially with music, it starts to go into those places I mentioned earlier, the amygdala, where our emotions are, the hippocamp hippocampus, where our memories and experiences are. 
the motor cortex, which makes us tap. Interesting, when we hear music, it also activates our visual cortex, which I think is fascinating. That's because when we hear music, we often try to find imagery that matches the rhythm that we're hearing. So that's activated too. And in an effort to sort of engage more parts of your brain, I'm gonna add music and to see if this experience is different. So if we could hit play on this one too. shared this with an audience before and the second one led somebody to come up to me and say I, I want to be a foster parent because of this so I hope this moved you and I hope this worked I hope this was useful what story will you tell thank you Well, I thank you folks in the room and the people that are in our virtual audience. We're pretty lucky because that was, to my mind, a really great session. Uh, we have some time left, so we're going to use that to hear from you, to hear from the virtual participants. Um, but first of all, I wanted to start things out with uh, just a really quick explanation and then a couple of questions for you. Um, Marge and Christina are the filmmakers who made the Building Community, Building Hope series. If you're not familiar with it, this film that they showed a clip of is actually the fourth film they've made in that series. So I, if you haven't seen any of them, I hope you will check those out and see other topics and how they were addressed. Um, and there are more films yet to come, including one that should be out very uh, within the next couple of months. But because the Children's Bureau has invested in this way of storytelling that they have um, produced for us, I have a question just for those of you who are, actually I'm not sure how we can get uh, input from our virtual audience, but if you want to use the chat box to say whether or not you've used the films, that's the question I have you. First of all, if you're in the room and you've seen one or more of the Building Community, Building Hope series, would you raise your hand just very briefly? There you go, ladies. And if you've used the film, other than viewed it, but used it for some purpose that you have uh, had a need for, could you also raise your hand? Okay, I think that tells us a lot about what we need to know about work that needs to be done, um, but we are, will be headed in that direction to make these um, resources more useful to all of you. So, um, thank you for your input. We do, um, the people in the back that are monitoring the virtual audience, let us know if you have comments or questions, but I'm gonna start the conversation out with a question for all of you, and that is, Marge or Christina, what information did Kurt share that you found particularly important or striking or if you had, if you want to challenge him on any of his points, I'd like to hear from you as to what you would say to Kurt in response to his presentation. You want to go? I'm gonna, sure. You want to go first? Sure. Go first. Um, for, I love the presentation, and for me, what's great about the presentation is that we are sort of 
coming at storytelling from the observational, we just seen what works kind of place. But so much of what you're saying about how the brain actually works and takes information in really resonated with us. And we were instantly like, we, we've got to investigate this more. Because even as, obviously we're filmmakers in a visual medium, but we don't, I don't know, we do know that music matters. We do use all those elements, but I, I just feel like we have so much to learn to dig into the data visualization and its relationship to the brain that we want to use to inform us so that we can do our jobs better too. So that, I mean, that was my first um, gut response. I, for the most part, I feel like we're talent, we are singing from the same song sheet. We're talking about different mediums. Uh, so I don't have anything uh, provocative and challenging to say, but I do feel like Marge and I instantly looked at each other like, we've got to look into this brain and visualization stuff. What's up with this brain stuff, Ooh, Christina? Well, um, I, I just think, Kurt, you're a, such a fantastic storyteller, and I think, you know, uh, I'm a professional storyteller, and I use some technology and some tools that make it seem like not everybody can be a storyteller, but we're all storytellers. I mean, we're all inherently storytellers because we all are humans, and we live on this planet, and we share experiences, and it's really that simple, you know? And I think that that's, you know, we travel around the country for this work and other work, and, you know, I spent time in in prisons, I spent time with you know all sorts of people from all walks of life who really have nothing in common with my life other than the fact that we are human. We care about people. We have hopes and dreams. I mean, you know, we lose people. We love people. I mean, this is just it's the stuff that binds us. And the more that we can focus on the stuff that binds us, the easier it is for all of us to feel part of one story of humanity and to help each other and, and to want the best for each other. It just seems really kind of clear to me. So, so you're just a really good storyteller. Maybe I will pick up some tips from you. I was really <laughs> impressed with your stories. And your kid is super cute. Super I will cute. Give you that. Super adorable. <laughs> yes. And Kurt, the same question back to you. So I think that the part that I love the most is your efforts to be authentic. And in that moment when you came into that house and it was a mess, you could have sanitized it and cleaned it, but it wouldn't have been the real story. And I think we have this, uh, this need to feel perfect and present perfect ourselves. And if we are behind the camera or behind the visualization, behind the report, we think that also needs to look perfect and flawless. And when we do that, it's no longer the real story. We start to lose a lot of the realness in that. And so I thought that was so important is that you, you let her be who she was, you let her home be what it was, and you didn't try to fix it or change it because that's what the whole story was. Um, so I think that was great, and I think that relates to, you know, I, I debated a lot of whether I should tell the story about my dad, because A, I was like, I didn't want to cry, because <laughs> that's no fun. Um, and, and I also said I didn't want to bring everyone so low, and so I tried to soften it with some humor. Um, but I also realized that we have to be vulnerable to tell a good story. Yeah. You know, and, and you can't tell a good story if you're not willing to let yourself open up a little bit. And that can affect the quality of your work, too, especially if you're in this kind of work. You have to be able to be vulnerable yourself. And, uh, and because when you accept that, the person across from you, you can let them be authentic and vulnerable as well. And just to add to that, I think, you know, we're talking about people right now, but we can translate this to our organizations as well. Organizationally, we do try to, we don't usually want to share the difficult parts of the obstacles. We have this tendency to put the strongest foot forward when we're trying to do something as an organization to tell our story, and it's all the good, super positive stuff. And, and that, you know, makes us less accessible. I think sharing the struggle and engaging people, sharing the importance of the work, the, co you know, the capability you have to deal with stuff, but also the challenges, invites people in to help you with your work. So I think we, we should think about that not only, you know, people engage with us as humans when we're real, people engage with us as organizations when we're real as well, and we can be, a little bit of transparency is not a bad thing. So I just encourage you to think about ways that you're, you can be willing to open up a little bit as an organization, warts and all, so that you can get people to engage and help you overcome the obstacles that you're facing. And also, for me, it's to remember that a story is an open door, which is an invitation to walk through it. You know, Kurt's visualization there at the end, you know, it's, it, it doesn't give you all the information about everything you ever needed to know about child abuse in America in any particular given year, you know? Our story about the program in Washington doesn't give you all the nuts and bolts of how they fixed it and then they went to this legislator and that, you know, it doesn't need to give you all that. What it needs to do is hook you and make you care and, and invite you to walk through the open door. And once you care, then there's tons of other information that you can go out and find. 
But until you invite people through that door or manage to pull them through that door, you're competing with every other thing that's trying to catch their attention out there. And that's why when it's like in some 238 page you know, document, I don't want to read a 238 page document because you know, the, bat the season finale of The Bachelor is starting, right? So that's just, we're, we just need to be real about that. So, so I think story doesn't have to be the be all and end all of everything. It doesn't have to say everything about you. It just needs to be human and to invite people in to learn more. And we, we use the term all the time that film is a portal way Marge is talking about that door, it's not all things, it's a portal, it's a way to get people to move through a door in the same way that you were talking about transportation mm -hmm. or that we talk about the journey. There is this very dynamic element of movement to these things that draws people towards you and again, not the whole story, but thinking about it as a portal allows you to realize you don't have to name every aspect of your theory of change in your film. That's on your website or, you know, there's marketing material support this work, but it shouldn't be in this work. So just thinking about storytelling as a separate tool in the toolkit and other things work together with it. I can't believe it, but we have used the time that we have available and therefore I, I cannot take any questions from you, but Marge and Christina have committed to staying behind. I don't know, I can't speak for Kurt. Yes, okay. uh, so let's, rethink how we're going to do this. Just come up and let's have a conversation if you have, want to have a conversation with any of these remarkable people. There was one question I do feel compelled to answer, which is when does this film premiere? And I will only say at this point, I cannot tell you, except because it is going through 508 compliance, and most of you know what that means, but I understand that it should be widely available on the website and for your use soon. <laughs> Very soon. I don't know what that means, but soon. <laughs> I've heard that one before. Uh, uh, but, um, so with that, I think we probably, our virtual audience is, I don't know how it works with that either, whether you shut something off and they go away. If they're still involved, we're glad to take questions from them. They're, they're in that black box someplace. But you are not. So if you want to have a conversation, continue the conversation, we will do so for as long as these folks are willing to stay here. Thank you again to Marge, Christina, and Kurt.